So, um, yeah, thank you, Surf Life Saving New Zealand, for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to come and talk to those guys who are out there doing it. And um, we're going to just go through a few things. Let's start by telling you where we're from. Portsmouth, down in the south of England, Extreme Environments Laboratory, minus 25, plus 50, all the labs up to 8,000 metres. So we can, we can recreate pretty much uh, any um, environment we want. Um, our reason for being is to investigate the physiological and psychological responses to extreme environments and the selection, preparation, and protection of those who enter such environments. And that gives us a really broad remit, because you can do pretty much what you like under that remit. Um, and of course, what we then, part of that is the selection and preparation is where we start to talk about things like occupational fitness standards. Um, so I'm going to just run through a few studies that we've done. If you have any questions or comments or, you know, or what you want to add to the debate, just stick your hand up as we go along, because I don't want to have to go right back to the start to find the slide. Uh, so we'll have a fairly, hopefully, um, a to and fro session. So let's start with the fitness standards for beach lifeguards. Uh, and Adam has given you the, the background to that. Um, you can tell that's a first-year beach lifeguard because he's actually paddling away from the guy in trouble. But uh, that's a different point. Um, we do quite a lot of work, and we hear the phrase gender fair quite a lot. You know, it has to be gender fair. And, of course, what people forget is that if you start having different standards for males and females, you can be equally charged with being gender unfair to males. And this has already happened in Canada. It's happened in police dog handlers in the UK, where a guy has passed the female standard to get into a job, failed to get the male standard, and then taken the employers to court. So that's, we've always come at this from the point of view of having a task-based standard. What do you have to do? And then if you can do it to a minimal acceptable standard, then it doesn't really matter whether you're able, disabled, male, female, anything. Um, the real, be careful when you ask that question though, as an organization, because they'll come straight back to you and say, what's a minimum acceptable standard? And that's where it gets tricky. You know, if you're working on an oil rig, what's the slowest you're prepared to have somebody go up a ladder? Um, so make sure you've thought that through. If you want to read all of the sort of rather turgid and boring stuff about v validity, reliability, objectivity, subjectivity that surrounds this, um, have a look at those papers. I'm not going to talk about them. So the various international standards, when we looked at this, um, and there they are, or up there on the slide. This was for beach lifeguards, but they were kind of based on performance, on the sports side of things. And when we ask, can you tell us what the justification is for having to swim 400 meters in eight minutes, nobody really knew. It just evolved as a number and a distance. In fact, my favorite one of all is the height standard in the Royal Navy, where you, can, you have to be five foot five to join the Royal Navy, but you can be five foot four and a half if you do well on the intelligence test. <laughs> um, I guess it's because you're smart enough to find a box to stand on. I don't know what it is. But so. So, um, so when we took on this project, we started by doing um, the task analysis. And that's the foundation of everything you do. You talk to lifeguards, you video, you watch what they do, you do analyses, beach surveys. You then go on to do a field test to assess the physiological demands of the tasks. Um, and you look at the various components of fitness, and then you establish a minimum generic standard. And it's a minimum standard. It's very easy to get sucked into it being a maximum standard. Then you find you don't have enough people on the beaches. And we're always very conscious of that. So we're always saying, what's the minimum standard? Um, and when we did that, we found the most um, demanding tasks in the UK for beach lifeguards were swimming or paddling to a casualty, may require some searching under the water, Sea swim or um, towing a casualty, board paddle with a casualty, or casualty handling. I suspect that's probably similar here. Um, let me know if it's not. Um, this is now where we are a little bit towards the subjective, but you have to get some kind of consensus about how quickly you have to get to a casualty. And some of you in the audience, I'm sure, will know um, Dr. Frank Golden, a collaborator with myself for 30 years, Mark Harries, one of the medical officers of certainly sadly both of those guys no longer with us, and Tony Handley from the ROSS. And this was the kind of rationale we came up for. Face down submersion, 
maximum time you've got to get to somebody um, is less than two minutes. If you're in, normally people are not going to go straight like that. They're going to have a period of being in difficulty. Um, so they'll struggle for one to two minutes. And so if you add that um, struggle to a period of submersion where you've got a good chance of recovery, you're looking around about three and a half minutes or 210 seconds with a total time getting them back to the beach to commence CPR of about 10 minutes. And that's, you know, I th that, uh, there's, there are some papers in the literature about the consequences of longer than 10 minutes um, and where the likelihood of a successful resuscitation plummets, reaching about zero at about 25 minutes, unless the water is ice cold. We'll talk about that later. Um, the important thing about this, this 10 minutes and, and three and a half minutes, is that it assumes immediate recognition and response by the lifeguards. And that has implications for surveillance. And the thing that always struck me at this stage when we were looking at this is when you look at the first aid manual for most lifeguard organizations, of that, that much of it is first aid, and there's probably nothing on surveillance, or there's very little. It's got better, I think, in the, in the decades since we've done this. Um, so there's... Um, uh, a pool swim, 200 meter pool swim of lifeguards, and that's um, the time for the 200 meter swim, and that's the percentage um, um, that can achieve any, any given time. And there's your 210, and we found that 95% of lifeguards tested could swim 200 meters in three and a half minutes, which is good. Uh, it's pretty well as you'd expect. Is that two minutes come from where? From brain activity? Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's um, 200 meters in three and a half minutes. So that's to get out, secure the casualty, and start coming back. And then a six and a half minute return gives you a 10 minute total. Um, the interesting thing for us at this stage was that the time to paddle 400 meters, only 30% of lifeguards could paddle 400 meters in three and a half minutes. Um, and that created a problem. At that time, correct me if I'm wrong, Adam, the RNLI was signing contracts with local councils saying that they would guard beaches up to 400 meters out to sea. And as a result of that graph, they went back and renegotiated and came back to 300 meters, which is a perfectly reasonable thing, you know, is rather than trying to make the guy fit the task, why not make the task fit the guy, which is a principle that you can apply across the board. Yeah, not all beaches have IRB, so an IRB can get that. Yeah. But where they don't, we have to constrain the control area and contract it. Yeah. Um, so, um, and most lifeguards, if they're going to swim, wouldn't swim further than 200 meters anyway. It would be a, a paddle beyond that. So it kind of comes down to that the fifth percentile paddling speed, um, which is you know, the lowest percentile down towards the, out, the lowest end of the pa uh, swimming, uh, paddling speed, can cover 289 minute, uh, meters in three and a half minutes. So that was the change we made as a result of just monitoring what people were doing. So 0 to 200 meters, swim, paddle, IRB, 200 to 300 meters, not 400 meters, paddle, IRB, and 300 to 400 meters, IRB. But in fact, they, they pulled back the, the distance to 300 meters. And then you can go and look at the physical demands, physiological demands of swimming, towing, and paddling. And we did this in a swimming flume. At the time, there were no swimming flumes in the UK that we could use. So we did this in um, the submarine base in Sweden, which was an interesting experience, going into a submarine base to do your experiments. Uh, but uh, we, so we took a load of lifeguards out there. We took the boards, the, et cetera, et cetera, and we did the studies. And we also did some studies in the sea off of the coast of, um, around the coast of the UK, quite a lot of them in Perimporth. This is in Perimporth. And when we're doing that, this is incidentally, you know, we're measuring oxygen con consumption, we're me measuring physical, physical demands, physiological demands of doing it. And one of the close correlations we've got, we got was um, that the physical, physiological characteristics of freestyle swimming is similar to that of paddling. And the performance of a lifeguard on the 400 meter freestyle swim in a pool corresponds with paddling performance out to sea. So these are individual subjects, each of these dots, this is their freestyle 400 meter time, and this is their time to paddle 400 meters. Remarkably, remarkably predictive and similar. But I guess if you think about it, you're laying on a board, you're doing this. You're swimming in a pool, you're doing this. It's, it's pretty similar. 
So from that, we could calculate that somebody should be able to paddle 310 meters in the sea in less than three and a half minutes. That's that three magic three and a half minutes that we've talked about, provided they can swim 400 meters in a pool in less than seven and a half minutes. And so the seven and a half minutes comes not as a swim, it comes as a predictor of paddling capability. So when you put that together with other stuff, which I'm not going to go into in great depth, um, we'd have a pool swim of 200 meters in less than three and a half minutes for people swimming to a casualty. That's a direct measure of swimming performance. You have a pool swim of 400 meters in less than seven and a half minutes to predict 300 meter paddle performance. Um, an underwater overwater <coughs> swim, which caused an incredible amount of nausea. Um, but they, because oh, you can't get people to swim underwater, they've got a bloody lifeguard. I mean, what are they going to do if they get there and someone's under the water? Um, and we were, I think the RLSS didn't like that test at all. They've now done about five and a half thousand of them and had no problem whatsoever. I mean, you do have to be make sure that people aren't hyperventilating like mad before they go under the water. But it was, was it a German guy at the World Congress on Drowning Prevention who said, I mean, this test is you, um, you swim 25 meters underwater, come to the surface, and swim 25 meters at the surface back. So you've got you know, a little bit of underwater, a little bit of overwater. And he said, I don't see what the problem is. He said, in Germany, our housewives will do this. <laughs> and that was the end of that debate. Um, and then there's some other stuff um, there to do with lifting and shifting. And on the same vein, we've done, but I'm not going to go into it now, a quite separate um, physical standards for... Um, PWC and IRB operations. So that's your essentially your, your, your jet ski and your inshore rescue boat. And that's mostly to do with lifting and shifting. We have all the measurements of the forces they require, and that's been turned into a test as well. Okay, and there's lots more to do with that, and I've put a, on the slides when you see the YouTube thing, you'll see the references to the stuff you can read. I want to spend a little bit of time on eyesight standards for beach lifeguards. Um, there weren't really any definitive eyesight standards when we started this work. I'll just give you a bit of background. You'll know that you'll have heard 2020 vision, so you know that normal visual, ac uh, visual acuity is 2020 in feet or 66 in meters. And that means that at six meters, the test subject should be able to see the same as a normal person with good eyesight. Um, if you've got 612, it means that a test subject can see the same at six meters as a normal person with good eyesight can see at 12 meters. So that's slightly worse. The maximum visual acuity of the human eye um, without visual aids is generally thought to be about 64. So um, you can see at six meters what the normal person would see at four. That's pretty good. Um, it's much better than a dog. Don't use a dog to go looking for things, uh, unless they smell. <laughs> um, um, but do use an eagle, which has a visual acuity of a 6, 1.5. You can calculate through trigonometry, trigonometry the visual acuity that is required to see a human head at 300 meters. And um, it's horrible. It's really quite hard. It's, it gives you a visual acuity of 6.17. Um, so we thought, well, it's okay. It's one thing looking at, a, you know, some letters on a Snellen board, but what about what actually happens in the real situation? Because people see different things. Um, how many dolphins do you see in this? Uh, how many dolphins do you see? Any idea? Huh? Yeah, they, I think there's 11. Yeah? Um, Yeah, the, it's nearly all dolphins. There's one there, there's one there, there's one there, there's one there, there's one here, there's one there, there's one there, there's one there, there's one here, there's one there. They're all over the place. There's a little one there. Okay, so the point I'm making is people see different things. Um, and those of you who don't see dolphins should leave the room now. <laughs> the, <laughs> they're off. <laughs> they, they're my rugby friends that are travelling with me, <laughs> in, case, in case you needed to be told. Um, so we wanted to look in an operational scenario. So this always raises a chuckle. Anybody who's been over lifeguarding in Bournemouth will know David VB. Um, and we had somebody in the water at around about 300 metres, and these guys didn't see them go in, and they were blurred to 670. And um, then gradually we um, 
We gave them a minute to look, and then we changed the diopter of the lens until it got clearer and clearer and clearer. And we told them, tell us when you would investigate something that you've seen using binoculars. And we decided, we determined what the visual acuity was on that basis. And we did it in a whole range of different situations, um, identifying arm waving, identifying a human head, um, identifying immersed to the waist, um, in different situations, both in Bournemouth, which is pretty flat calm, and in Westwood Ho, which was a little bit choppier. And on the basis of that, um, we came to the visual acuity to identify a human head at 300 meters in the sea is 6.7. Um, this is written up in the British Journal of Ophthalmology, if you want to follow it up. We said that also, um, because that could exclude some people, we're very much into being inclusive. There should be some consideration given to allowing life guys to wear glasses, which wasn't the case at the time. It just seemed kind of strange that a lifeguard would drive to the beach with glasses on and then have to take them off to do the lifeguarding. Um, not, doesn't fulfill, or doesn't fill you with confidence, really. Um, and we said it would be logical to base the uncorrected eyesight on what, the, what they need to see in order to make them investigate further. So we, it seemed logical to base the requirement for uncorrected eyesight on what the beach lifeguards needed to see when they removed their glasses. So, okay, they're now going to take their glasses off, but they've already identified it's there, you know, and they're moving towards it. So that's a different type of surveillance and acuity than looking for something in a vast space in the first place. Um, so when you pan all of this out, the uncorrected vision in the worst eye had to be at least equivalent to that required to see a head from 200 meters or an arm waving from 300 meters, which is about 614. That converts to a Snellen chart of about um, corrected vision of 6.9, best eye, 6.18, worst eye, and the unaided acuity to be no worse than 6.18 in either eye. So that's where we ended up on the basis of, on, but it was on, based on a realistic, pragmatic scenario. Yeah, I mean, the other thing to note about this is um, David Anton, who was at the time um, running the occupational health for the um, RNLI surf lifesaving, was really pleased that, uh, that, that the RNLI had introduced a fitness standard that involved people doing things physical because it helped him with his a medical assessment. You know, if they'd come through this fitness test and they'd passed it, then he was pretty confident about going on then and doing the various medical assessments. So um, the next question that intrigued me was, we've had crow's nests on ships for centuries, but has anyone ever seen anywhere how you should look out to sea in order to um, try and see a, a man overboard or the like, or an enemy ship, depending on where you, which occupation you're in? There's lots of stuff written about scanning in, in a little bit in, in swimming pools, and there's quite a lot about search patterns, expanded box patterns, horizontal uh, scanning, vertical scanning. Much less to do with how beach lifeguards should look out to sea. And so, um, with my colleagues, and you, we, we now, you're working with Jenny now, so we've, there are people in the room who have done some work in this area. There's Jenny, and we use an eye tracking device, and um, it shows you exactly where the pupils go which is kind of interesting right at the start of the experiment when Jenny, who's very attractive, puts this thing on and the guys follow her all around the room. Uh, we, have to, we have to delete that bit. Um, and we started, off, we started off with a very simple computer-generated scenario because we wanted um, it only, the only cue to be somebody disappears. So they watched this and one of these heads would disappear um, over the course of a five-minute video. So there were no other distractions. There were no noises. There were no shouts. There were no boats coming through. It was purely looking at um, people's ability to detect. Now, uh, in the screen that you look at, they don't have this grid. This grid is for analysis purposes. We then progressed to create a beach scene. So we know everybody on this beach. It's not a random beach. It's, uh, this is Jenny's mum and dad here. There's the guys I work with at Portsmouth. That's his mum. You know, I can actually tell you who everyone is. And they, and they ran to a script. So at five minutes, this guy would go and walk down to the, to the sea. 
there, was a, there were things coming in here. So there were lots of different things happening. And the same analysis goes on. You then secure the boxes, and then you can see how many times the beach guards look into each of those boxes. It's a really complicated, mass of data kind of analysis. And it looks a bit like that when you get it out in the raw form. So this is, these are the boxes, and there's the eye movements, and that's how long people moved and how long they stayed fixed, the fixations in each of those, in each of those areas. But it tells you how people look. And the other thing you can do with this kind of um, approach is you can then ask people, you can train them to do horizontal scanning. So they do scanning like this, or to do vertical scanning, so they scan like that. Or they can do a scanning which is a, a sort of doing an expanded or a contracting box scanning. And we looked at all of those. Um, and what you find is it's quite interesting because we, were, we knew where people were looking when one of these guys disappeared. Actually, the... the the person in the video is our technician's girlfriend that he just split up with. So he, he just had a drowning all over the place. It was, it was, not, it was not an amicable separation. The, um, uh, it's always nice to know the true background, isn't it? So, so this person disappears here, and the, and the lifeguard is looking there, but sees the head disappear. So that's um, don't look, but see. They're not actually looking in the right box, but they just with peripheral vision. Um, which is particularly sensitized to, to a movement, of course. And then there's others who are looking absolutely bang on, then they look, but they don't see. They're looking at that square, and they don't see it disappear, because they're not thinking. They're thinking about something else. They're not, they're not concentrating on what they're seeing. And I'm not going to go through the many studies we've done on that, um, and uh, I'll tell you where we're at. But on the basis of that, we had um, a measure of the experience of lifeguards, which talked about how long they'd been on the beach, what they'd done, how many incidents, et cetera, et cetera. And we can categorize them into less than one year of beach um, surveillance and more than one year. And if you look at that split, the experienced lifeguards are about 4.5, nearly five times more likely to detect, to detect a person disappearing in the water. Um, the lifeguards change their surveillance pattern based on the distribution of swimmers rather than the number. Um, and lifeguards are equally efficient at detecting swimmers in trouble in the water regardless of the type of scanning pattern they adopt. If you let them free scan, they do as well as if you give them a pattern. But you can give them a pattern. You can train them in a pattern. <coughs> the median value um, increases from two detections to three detections when you work alone to working in pairs. So if you add another lifeguard and they look as a pair, you increase, um, but you don't double the detections. Um, so experienced lifeguards spot twice as many hazards, so those hazardous um, scenarios that we created on the beach. Less experienced lifeguards were more active. So we summarize that by saying experienced people, and I think this is the same right across the board in rugby, in all sport, experienced people see more and do less, which is why your managers don't do that much, because they see more, but they don't, they don't have to do as much. Yeah? The, the inexperienced... Every time they saw something that was potentially a problem, they would, they would, they, their action would be to sprint down the beach and sort it out. Um, the eye movements between the experienced and inexperienced were pretty similar in terms of their um, frequency of movement and their duration, which tells you it's a processing thing. Um, now, the real question is, how do you make somebody experienced? Is there something you can do to condense the period where they go from being inexperienced to being experienced. And we think there probably is. Or we think that the videos that we've created and the measures we've taken um, are the basis of a good training package, and that's the point we're at. So that's basically the last point on this slide. Um, one of the things that has been has changed with time, I think both in lifeboating and in lifeguarding, is historically you didn't have to worry too much about a lifeboatman or a lifeguard skill set because they had grown up in the area that they were going to go and work in and they were used to the conditions, they understood the conditions. But it, the way things are now, people move about a lot. And so sometimes you have people who are doing, say, beach lifeguarding on the south coast of um, Britain, which would be a bit like your east coast of Auckland, and then they go 
to the north coast of Cornwall, which is a big surf beach. From here, it would be going from the east to the west. And the question then is, do that, does that skill set work when you're on a different type of beach? And so we were quite interested in looking at the, the skill component of surf swimming. Is there a specific skill component? And um, to do that, we looked at um, no surf experience individuals versus surf experience individuals, 65 lifeguards, um, and we established that experience with a questionnaire. And then we matched them according to their 200 meter pool swim. So we had these guys swimming 200 meters, males and females mixed, and they would do exactly the same 200 meter swim time in a pool. But some of them were experienced in the surf, some of them were inexperienced, but they basically, their basic swim speed in a pool was the same. Um, they then went to Gillan Vase, which is a flat calm beach off Falmouth on the south coast of, of um, Britain, um, down in the West Country, in Cornwall. And they did it zero wave height, 16 degree water temperature, and then we got them to do exactly the same thing, essentially race over 200 meters, but this time it was in the surf of Perrinport. Um, sim swims were started immersed to the waist to make sure that there was no difference in running ability, because of course you can run further into a surf beach because it's a shallower beach. Um, and here's the results. So really the only point to get to on this particular study was that there is a significant difference in the surf swimmer's ability to swim in the surf. I don't think that comes as any great surprise, but it's quite nice to have it quantified, and it also has some implications. So um, firstly, the pool swim time is not an indicator of an individual's ability to swim in the surf. Because all... Okay. No. No, straightforward swimmer. Um, pool swimming is not an indicator of an individual's ability to swim in the surf. Um, it is an indicator of your ability to swim in a calm sea. Surf experience can reduce 200 meter swim time by an average of 18%. Um, and it's likely that skill component of surf swimming appears to be due to navigation sea by seamanship. I mean knowing when to dive, when to run, when to hurdle, when to do that kind of thing. It was quite interesting to watch really big guys thinking that they could take on a ton of water. Uh, and whereas you'd watch some of the smaller people who just knew what they were doing, just went out like a porpoise. It was really good to watch. So those findings have implications for the assignment of beach lifeguards, lifeguards to beaches. And um, some consideration, we recommend, it should be given to giving people formal surf swimming instruction um, when they um, turn up at a surf beach if they don't have that experience. That's written up in that paper there if you want to read it. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about um, sudden cardiac death on immersion, which is another area of work that we've done, but particularly want to concentrate on the applied side of it. So um, you'll probably be aware that 80% of the deaths in triathlon occur in the swim, um, which, of course, is the first of the disciplines. You might expect more deaths to occur at the end, so something's happening. And, of course, these are not... These deaths are occurring in people who haven't you know, just turned up to do a triathlon. They'd done loads of open water swimming. So one of the questions that we wanted to ask was, why do people die in an event, but they don't die when they're training? Um, you'll be aware, because I'm sure you know, that you have a cold shock response when you go into cold water, which is a tachycardia, drives your heart rate up and your cardiac output. And if you do a face immersion or a face-only immersion, then you can get a good chance of getting a diving response, which is bradycardia, which slows the heart rate down. Um, I always say at this point that that's my, one of my favorite slides because you know this guy's in trouble if they've replaced the doctor with a prune. <laughs> they've got a prune. So uh, that's not one of our experiments. That's a Russian experiment. Isn't it? Um, so what happens when you combine those two? Well, um, we um, have demonstrated, I think, reasonably clearly that if you go under the water, so now you've got the cold shock response, and you've got face immersion, so you've got the cold shock response trying to drive the heart rate up and the diving response trying to pull it down, you'll get what we've called autonomic conflict. And it's a really common way of initiating a cardiac arrhythmia. In fact, it's so common that um, if I took everybody in this room and did a submersion with a breath hold, within 10 seconds of breaking your breath hold, about 80-odd percent of you would show some kind of dysrhythmia or arrhythmia. Um, 
It happens all the time. We see it, and when it does happen, people tend to show the same kind of arrhythmia. It'll be supraventricular or ventricular, and the same kind of pattern. It's almost like a signature. And we've done studies where we've done immersions three times on people, and they show exactly the same pattern. Um, it doesn't tend to descend into something more dangerous, we think, unless you've got some of these pre-existing and predisposing factors, and we're currently using animal model to look at um, how those predisposing factors actually interact and work. Um, why does the incidence of sudden cardiac death increase during competition, especially when swimming? Is there a link between autonomic conflict and sudden cardiac death? Well, when you're training in open water, you tend to go for a swim. And you swim along, and you breathe, and it's, everything's nice. You, you know, you're in a lovely environment. There's no stress, particularly. When you're in a competitive environment, anybody here done triathlon mass start? OK, you know, you know what I'm about to say. Um, if you now go and do a swim, but now when you turn to breathe, you can't breathe, you hold your breath, and you go back into the water, or you get some wa water up the nasopharynx into the nose, which is a very powerful vagal stimulus, slowing the heart. And also, if you get angry. Um, anger is a really good way of, of coincidentally stimulating the cardiac um, autonomic nervous system, parasympathetic and sympathetic. And that's why most of you, anybody who has a chance to go onto a cardiac ward, ask the people what their last emotion they remember having was. And it's probably road rage, anger, or something like that. Um, why do you get angry? Um, so anger, competition, water entering the nasopharynx, extended breath hold time, would not normally be present during training, but it is present during open water mass starts. If anybody recognizes it, that's the Nice Iron Man, which is like being in a washing machine. We have, yeah. I'll, I'll show you a report on that in a moment, which I'm not going to go into, but we have looked at open water swimming. And generally, we you can reduce significantly the number of arrhythmias you see depending on how you go about organizing the event. And that's really what I want to get to here. Um, the problem is, uh, being an electrical disturbance of the heart, this is not picked up at post-mortem. So inevitably, it tends to default to drowning. And also, during the agonal gasping that comes as a result of a cardiac problem, you take water into the lung, it looks very like, it looks very like drowning. So this is a list of um, suggestions. If you, any of you are involved in organizing uh, mass starts or multi-discipline you know, um, exercise events that involve swimming, I mean, these are fairly obvious. You could tell me these. In fact, I, I, I pretty well was told them, to be honest. There's a couple in there where I'm going a little bit out on a limb. I'm not sure anger management is, should be right up there, as a, but you never know. You've got to... You've got to try not to get angry um, when you're being swum over or your wetsuit is being pulled from behind. So there's a whole list of factors that can um, reduce the likelihood of getting those coincidental inputs to the heart that cause potential cardiac problems and sudden cardiac death. What about pre-immersion? Yeah. Um, I think pre-immersion is useful because um, you can take out the cold shock response. And we, uh, in the report I'll show you in a minute, we've, we've recommended in water lower than, I can't remember, 20 degrees Celsius, I think it was, um, that people should be given the opportunity for pre-immersion. It will reduce the sympathetic drive, but it doesn't get rid of it because you've got it from the exercise and from the, well, from the excitement of doing the swim. So you've still got a big sympathetic drive. It's just that you haven't got uncontrollable breathing with it. What's the time frame? The time frame? Yes, so, the, the, so, if, so if your question is, yeah, you're, th this is most problematic in the first minute, yeah? When you've got a maximum cold shock response, you've got probably a maximum diving response, you've got maximum confusion between people. So is that, was that the so question? If you, if you were trying to manage it by saying everyone's pre-emerged, and then yeah. and then a back, and then a start, just, just what's the time frame you have? Oh, I would, sorry. Yeah, so I would, if I was going to do that, I'd get an in-water start for a start. I'd get, like, the last one I did was an in-water start in Leeds. Um, and you get into the water, I'd give people a minute or two to adapt and then go. And just keep the numbers small and spread them out. But the, the French don't do that. The French say, go. 
it's great because when people swear at you in a foreign language, I just take it as a compliment. Um, this, I just put this up because this is something that some of you know that we've been involved in, and this is where we recommend the pre-immersion um, in cold water. And it was really aimed at elite athletes uh, in terms of water temperatures for open water swimming and triathlon. And that also contains some um, data on open water swimming, which covers the question you've just mentioned. Um, if, you haven't, if you can't get hold of that report, I can, I can send it to you. OK, last bit um, is when to stop a search. Um, and let's just have a quick look at this. started as a sled ride along the ice-coated rock on the shore of Lake Michigan at Wilson. A slip, and 35-year-old Terence Tantlewitz of 3818 West Montrose and his four-year-old son James were suddenly in the near-freezing water. A cross-country skier had seen the incident and had come to help, but he could not hoist the man up the six-foot rock wall. The child, meanwhile, had disappeared under the ice. The fire department arrived with ladders and desperately needed manpower, and the man was hauled up, out, and to a waiting ambulance. That left a child somewhere in the murky, ice-clogged water. By helicopter and special van, fire department scuba divers sped to the scene, wasting little time in donning rubber suits and air tanks. But time was running out. The child had already been under the water for more than 15 minutes. Time after time, the divers surfaced. Nothing, they shouted. But then, five minutes after they entered the water, the divers nodded. Success of a, a sort. <laughs> child had been underwater about a half an hour and we had thought there could be no hope for the boy's survival. But he lived, though it would be a critical case for some time to come. Um, so an interesting case, and a couple of things about that. Firstly, how quickly the father was incapacitated. That's peripheral cooling. That's neuromuscular cooling. That's not core temperature problem. Um, he must have been highly motivated to do something, but couldn't, um, because he was essentially physically incapacitated. And then the child, uh, what's the mechanism there? Well, we think the mechanism is selective brain cooling as part of the drowning process. Aspirating water in and out of the lung, cooling the heart, cooling the carotid artery supply to the brain, which very quickly cools the brain. We've seen seven, eight degree falls in two minutes in, in models of, of, of that particular scenario. Um, who, there's only, we did, a, we did a, a review of the literature and you can only find about 43 cases that are, you would regard as proper cases in terms of, you know, they're in the medical literature, the case studies. Um, but those cases stick in the mind of the guys going looking. So they're never quite sure when to stop. Um, the current longest with a successful resuscitation is 66 minutes. Um, 66 minutes, just over an hour. Um, and of course, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's not an issue when the people rescuing are not themselves at risk. But if they're going on for 66, 90 minutes, two hours in a situation where they're at risk, you've really got to weigh up the balance between, you know, the likelihood of recovering somebody alive and the likelihood of killing somebody who's trying to rescue them. And we've, when we were asked this question, you know, back around about 2012 and, and, and addressed it. And you'll tend to find that it's the uh, small child or adult that are involved. 67% of, of these cases, the um, individual is 12 years old or younger. It's nearly always fresh water. And the water temperature tends to be below 6 degrees Celsius. So the maximum you'll see as the water temperature falls towards 6 degrees is around about 20 minutes submersion. And that fits quite nicely with the literature um, uh, in terms of 10 minutes of reasonable 
possibility of falling down to about zero, about 25 minutes. But if the water is cold, all bets are off. So once the water gets below about six degrees Celsius, there's, the, there's your current record at 66 minutes, um, a two and a half year old child in America. So we translate that into um, some recommendations. Um, Start the clock on arrival at the scene. Don't believe anything anyone tells you because you know that these people will be confused or have no sense of time. Is the water warmer than six degrees? Yes, it's warmer than six degrees. About a 30 minute, um, you know, if your rescuers are themselves putting themselves at risk or in a nasty situation, 30 minutes is a reasonable period to search for. If the water is colder than six degrees, we recommend 90 minutes. Um, that's now been incorporated. It's quite nice. We, I, the title was evidence-based. That's quite nice to see that incorporated into the National Operational Guidance Program in the UK, where they will start, um, person submerged, yes, start the clock, information gathered, dynamic risk assessment, go, 30 minutes, is the water very cold? Yes, continue to 60 minutes. Is it young ad, um, individual or small adult? Yes, it is. Go to 90 minutes. That's freely available on the web if you want to go to this website here. Um, you can pick it up when you get the slides. Then go and have a look, because there's lots of other things on that website about rescue, water rescue, uh, and dealing with those kind of conditions. Um, I thought I would just finish with uh, one more bit of vi a video. Uh, when I came over here to talk for Maritime New Zealand, I can't remember when it was. It was maybe 2011 or 2013. It was really imp Yeah, sorry. Say again? The shocks in terms of um, defibrillation? No. No, this was just whether or not they survived to leave, leave hospital. Uh, and there's a kind of interesting corollary to that is what do, you, what, do you def what do you regard as a successful resuscitation? Is it complete recovery? Uh, now, I, I tell you, uh, I've asked this question a lot. I've never been asked that question, so I, I often ask myself it. Um, and the guy I asked was Mads Gilbert. Mads Gilbert is pretty famous for being the guy who resuscitated Anna Bagenholm. Now, Anna Bagenholm was the Norwegian skier who went under the ice for 90 minutes. She was brought out apparently dead, um, lifeless, fixed dilated pupils, no um, heart rate. Um, and Mads took it upon himself to resuscitate her in Tromso Hospital using all the wizardry and gadgetry that they had at their disposal. And she came around completely paralyzed and swore uh, from, the, from the sort of you know, chest down, um, swore at them for bringing her around and, and leaving her in this state. The neurologist put a, a circle on the, cal on the calendar on the wall. He said, we, we estimate you'll be OK by then. Got it right to almost the day, which is, you know, read it. It's in, written up in The Lancet, Gilbert et al, 2000. It's the story of the resuscitation of Anna Bagenholm. Um, when you ask Mads what his view about is in terms of a successful resuscitation, he'll say to the point of being able to communicate. I have no idea if that's right or wrong, but he's a pretty experienced medic. And if you get the chance to look at Mads Gilbert's website and see some of the other things he does, go do it. He's inspirational. So when I came over to the New Zealand, New Zealand last time for Maritime New Zealand, I was really impressed. You had, um, you had some TV commercials. Do you remember where people were getting into a car and doing up their seat belts. And they were saying, well, if you're prepared to do that when you get in a car, why don't you put a life jacket on when you get into a boat? And they were counterposing that. And it's really nice. Um, and the RNLI have, for some time, done a similar thing with the Respect the Water campaign. Now, you may or may not be aware of it. But for the last, it's been running four years. And for up to this point, that campaign has been about warning people about cold water, saying you'll get cold shock. You know, be careful, you know, but it really had to evolve. And so this year we evolved it a little bit. Uh, I helped out a bit in terms of saying, well, okay, f nearly 50% of those who fall into cold water had no intention of going in the water. Uh, that's the RNLI statistics. And for those people, telling them to be frightened of water is not really that effective. What you've got to tell them to do is what to do when they go into the water. And we know the cold shock response peaks in the first minute. It, it disappears after about a minute and a half. And we know that people's natural response when they go into cold water is to thrash about, to swim hard. We have all the data. 
We also know that if you make them stay still for two minutes before they do anything, they have a much better prognosis in terms of that first few minutes of, of immersion. So this led us to um, this year's campaign um, for the RNLI, which is, is slightly different. And I'll just, I'll just play it for you. Everyone who falls into cold it's really good. or unexpected <laughs> has the um, Let me just go back. What are you seeing now? Okay, hopefully you'll show you'll say now. Everyone who falls into cold water unexpectedly has the same instinct. To swim hard. To fight the cold water. But when people fight it, chances are they lose. Cold water shock makes them gasp uncontrollably and breathe in water. But if they just float, until the cold water shock has passed, they'll be able to control their breathing and have a far better chance of staying alive. Um, so that's this year's message. And that's going out in all the cinemas in the UK. And uh, oops, we don't want to see any more of the... Uh, that's going out in all the cinemas in the UK. And... Um, it's, uh, I, I think it's probably the right thing to do, you know, at this stage. Um, right, I think, probably, let me just get us on to where we are. I'm going to finish there, and if you've got any, any questions, so um, Adam has m mentioned the science of beach lifeguarding. There's the essentials of sea survival. If you go on Twitter, you'll find me at Prof Mike Tipton, and you can go on to, those of you aware of ResearchGate, which is a freely available um, research-based website where we, you know, we upload all of the papers that support what we've done, particularly have a look at the, the reviews. Um, that's it. Thanks very much for your attention. Have you take questions? Like? Yep. Questions about anything? Policy things? Yes, sir. So, um, I mean, I didn't go right into the mechanism, but if you lower brain temperature from 37 body temperature down to 30, because um, hypothermia is preserving in terms of oxygen usage, re reduces your metabolic rate and the metabolic rate of the tissue, then you can extend that 10-minute time that we've been talking about all through the first part of the lecture to about 20 minutes. If you get the brain temperature down to about 20, 22 degrees Celsius, That'll extend out to about an hour. Um, and so the mechanism is, as I say, it's essentially the drowning process where you're ventilating water in and out. The drowning takes about just under two minutes. And during that time, water is flushing in and out of the lung. If it's cold enough, it'll cool the heart. As long as you've still got some respiratory movement doing that flushing and your cardiac output stays going long enough, you'll cool the blood supply to the brain and you'll selectively cool the brain. And, and that's the mechanism that we, we think is accounting for it. Work done by Al Kohn in Seattle um, shows that in that first two-minute period, you can cool the brain by about uh, between 7.5 and 8.5 and degrees, uh, compared to 0.8 if you haven't got a head under immersion or submersion. In the next, 
after the breathing stops uh, and the heart the cardiac output stops, in the next eight minutes you cool about another two or three degrees, and that's surface cooling. And the reason we think it's mostly small children and small adults that are involved in these extended underwater survivals is because they'll cool more quickly, the higher surface area to mass ratio. So that mechanism worked with anyone, the first mechanism, but the second mechanism requires surface cooling. Um, I mean, that's it. The, the consequence for those measuring temperature when they rescue people is, of course, a rectal temperature, an esophageal temperature, an aural temperature, is likely not to have any prognostic value. The brain could be seven or eight degrees colder than a rectal temperature, for example. Um, hi. Um, well, I mean, I think I, I tried to... Pre Number one is you will have water that's cold, but it just happens not to be in the sea. Um, you've got, you know, you've got lots of lakes, you've got lots of cold rivers, you've got lots of other places where people can find themselves into very cold water. So we shouldn't get too hung... What's that? Is anyone, is anyone else hearing that, or is it just... <laughs> Well, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take all, few, all the questions you have down the pub. Yeah, that's good. Thanks very much.